So I'm the only one who is not a computer scientist or engineer. I'm a user of some of these softwares, and I've been very excited about using this since I learned about such techniques about five years ago. So what I'd like to do is to share with you my experiences and also hopefully interest some of the people sitting here to help me do a lot more problems that uh, I think are very interesting. So I work in design uh, for most of my research, so I would use design problem to motivate uh, and explain and show you how uh, wonderful such algorithms are. And uh, that's what you see there. And I will give you some uh, details of some of the illustrative applications. There are several of them, but uh, due to time constraint, I would I will show you how I can apply this to solve what I call tough problems uh, in designs. And these are some of this that I will briefly talk about and show you uh, how <coughs> with a live demonstration. So every time I go and talk, initially I was afraid to do live demonstration because it may not work. But nowadays I have enough confidence that I, when I let the swarm go, and you will find the solution in a couple of seconds. So uh, optimal design problems, just a very quick run through in case people are not familiar with it. This is probably the simplest problem uh, design that is even not discussed in most statistics classes. So you have the simplest model, you think uh, conceivable, straight line regression, and that's the regression function, and homoscedastic, and you're going to take independent observation from this study, assuming that the mean responses is basically a linear function of a single covariate x, assumed to uh, lie between some, uh, in this case, a prototype interval between minus one and one. And then you might say, what's the purpose of this experiment? I want to estimate parameters, sometimes just one of them. Sometimes uh, you might want to do two of them. So these are possible uh, goals in a study. And sometimes you might even want to estimate functions of the model parameters. So you could have a quadratic model instead of a simple linear model. And you say, I want to estimate the turning point of this quadratic. So design questions concern how should I pick observations from this design space so that uh, to observe the y, and after that, analyze the data to estimate this as best as possible. So if this is scalar, the first thing to ask is, how do I measure the goodness of my estimate? So in this case, it's very easy. You can look at the variance of the estimated quantity and then look hard at the expression and see if you can make anything out of that. So in this case, it's very straightforward. If you want to estimate the slope, look at the variance of the least squares estimate for the slope, and then easily can come up with a lower bound. And then uh, this lower bound is independent of the allocation of the axis. And if I can just play around with the axis, and if it attains the lower bound, I know for sure I have the best design for estimating uh, theta one. Any other allocation scheme will give you a higher variance, right? So in this case, uh, n could be 20 or 50, it doesn't matter. And so in this case, you can verify very easily, taking half the observations at both n is the best for estimating theta one, where these two becomes equality. You have to do it symmetrically. And not only that, if you actually uh, try to answer question three, you can likewise compute the variance of theta not hat. Uh, something expression will be a little bit different. And you say, how do I measure the goodness of these two quantity now? You can add the two variances. And you can also show that uh, taking observations at both ends would attain the lower bound for the sum of these two variances, in this case, twice sigma squared over n. So quite easy to do. And the last one is, interestingly, if you want to estimate theta naught, it turns out that there are infinitely many designs that will do as well. As long as the design is symmetric about zero, then that design will give you the smallest variance for estimating theta naught. So that suggests that you have a class of designs that you can choose from. And maybe within that, that class, you want to choose a design that also does better for some other purposes. So this is uh, the, probably the simplest design issues, uh, picking access. So my goal is to find out where to pick the access, how many points I need, and uh, exactly where they are. Okay? 
Now, this very simple technique would not even work if you go to quadratic. So this problem becomes very difficult very easily, let alone when you have nonlinear models and correlated observation and all the stuff, right? So for quadratic, the solution was only solved in 1984 or 1986 in GRSSB. And even then, they have to use quite a lot of mathematics to answer the question, how to allocate the axis to observe uh, the y to estimate the three parameters in a quadratic model. So generally, what I'm dealing with is you have a, what we call a design space. You are given this, where, how I can pick my axis to observe the responses. And I assume a parametric model, and there are unknown parameters in it. And for now, I can assume this, but these are not important assumptions. Uh, and then uh, I'm giving a sample size n. I'm not concerned about sample size determination. If I think I can recruit 80 patients for this study. In a dose response study, uh, how should I allocate different doses to these uh, patients to estimate quantities that I want? So that's the question I address given the design space uh, model and uh, the sample size, uh, how best to allocate these endpoints in the design space to observe the responses uh, optimally. So those questions are very difficult. Uh, Kiefer comes along in the 1958s, and basically he turned this problem into a slightly different one, but then it has a huge payoff in the sense that then it turns into a unified theory for constructing designs. So basically, the question here now, he talks about approximate designs. Uh, the problem is still I want to find how many points I need, where they are in the design space. But instead of finding how many patients to allocate each of those doses, just tell me the proportion of the total observations to take at each of those points. So basically, the problem reduces to finding k the x1 up to xk and the proportions of this uh, observation to take at these doses. So to implement this design, you just basically round this thing up so that you have an integer number of observation at this axis and subject to that criteria. Now, the previous problem was uh, to determine the direct number of observation at each of those doses directly. And this is a very, very difficult problem that even defy any sort of a solution right now, a general solution to finding optimal design. So this might seem a little bit uh, convoluted, finding the proportions, but he made it very clear that once you're willing to do that and you have a convex functional, so whatever your objective is, express it as the convex functional of what we call, this is very important quantity, uh, the Fisher information matrix. So you have a parametric model, you have a likelihood function, and this is what we, uh, uh, in statistics, capture the worth of the design. So you just take the second derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to the data and take the minus of the expectation of that. So it's a matrix that you work with that we want to formulate the goal or the aim of the, fun uh, of the study as a function of this information matrix. And once you're able to do that, he was able to come up with simple algorithms that find many types of optimal approximate design. And then not only that, he was able to use convex theory and quickly come up with uh, a very easy way to check whether you have the right optimal design. Give me any design, I can tell you whether that's optimal or not. And he used uh, the Frechet derivative uh, of that function. That's what we call sensitivity function. By studying properties of this sensitivity function, you know whether you have the optimal design. And not only that, if the dimension is small, you can draw some pictures and very quickly know whether you have the right answer. So you're trying to say this is the best design among all possible designs on the design space X. So it's infinite dimension, but uh, he was able to reduce this to very nice, elegant mathematical uh, techniques for solving this problem. So this is probably outdated now, but uh, he was saying in last time there are tables, statistical tables, uh, books of tables of the tables. So he would also have, uh, avoid having an endless list of optimal design for practitioners, right? Because for each model, for each criterion, and in this case, if you're working with exact optimal design for each end, you have to tabulate 
how to allocate your uh, number of observations uh, at where location. So that becomes very tedious. So by working with efficiency, uh, sorry, uh, approximate designs, uh, you have these advantages, including if I find out this design is not optimum, when I apply what we call equivalence theorem, I can also tell you how far it is from the optimum without knowing where the optimum is. So here's just a couple of examples to show you. Uh, if you have a simple linear model, you want to estimate all the parameters, that's the optimality, and you try to maximize the information matrix determinant, and you put a log in front to make it a concave functional, so it's almost same like convex. And then very quickly, you find that the optimal allocation uh, is half-half. If it's quadratic, it's equally spread between these three points. Now, in those response studies, you have other objectives. You cannot give a dose higher than what you deem are, is the safety limit. But you can certainly infer what I would get as a mean response if I give it a higher dose. So in this case, if Z is too outside this design space, that's what we call extrapolation design. So for the simple linear model, you will have to unequally assign more uh, proportion to the dose near one and the rest at minus one. And this is what you would do when you have a quadratic model. So, so far things are easy because those are linear models. And remember, these are functions of uh, the Fisher information matrix, which will contain parameters if you go to nonlinear models. So if the mean function cannot be written in terms of the model parameters in a linear fashion, that complicates the situation a lot more. And that's typically what we see in practice. So let's look at one typical example. So the logistic models is probably what many of you have seen before. We know how to analyze logistic models. But if I ask you, how would you actually take observations from, let's say, this interval so that you can have your best estimate for theta 1 and theta 2. So best here meaning that if you do the uh, confidence ellipsoid for theta 1, theta 2, you are guaranteed to have the smallest area for the confidence ellipsoid, right? Just like if you are only interested in estimating one parameter, then you are assured by picking the points cleverly or optimally, you are guaranteed the confidence interval for that parameter is the shortest possible. So what do you think this result is? Uh, so this is parametric, so you can compute the Fisher information matrix and calculate the, um, uh, uh, play with the scheme and see what allocation scheme would optimize the uh, determinant of the information matrix. It turns out this is the solution as reported in, in this thesis. So what this suggests is, well, this is a relatively simple problem. So first of all, to implement such design, I need to know roughly what these values are, even though I'm trying to estimate them. So these are called locally optimal design. My design depends on my best guess what these two parameters are. And basically, this is just a calculus problem. You have to spend a lot of time trying to partition the data space, R2, uh, into the right partition so that you can maximize it and conclude that, like in this case, if I think theta 2 minus theta 1 is bigger than this number A given by here, uh, solution to this, then uh, this is the solution equally weighted at two design points here and here. And if it's not, it depends to one of this region, and then it would also allocate observations always equally at only two points, which may or may not include the endpoints. So is it a difficult problem? Like who can remember such results, right? And not only that, such results are typical in the literature, but I don't like it because it doesn't, for instance, tell you what happened if this is minus one to five. Right? It's not easy to say, well, then I just add 5 to each of these points. So that's not very good. If I ask you what is uh, x squared, if I have x squared term, the solution is completely elusive. And I would add that even if you, if you have x1 and x2, so you have two factor experiment, uh, the answer is still not very clear. And if you add an uh, interaction term, somebody just worked out a solution last year. Okay, so this is 72. So the mathematics get very complicated very quickly. And 
I was saying like this is not helpful to the practitioners, right? Uh, so why not have a, a program and an algorithm that able to find solutions to this and many other such problems very easily? Have an interact, uh, interactive website where people punch in what these intervals are and then they can have x1, uh, x2, or x1, x2, and then with an interaction term, or x and x squared, or x cubed, right? So I really am convinced uh, evolutionary algorithm would be the way to go. So I actually ask my students to, every time I teach a class, I ask them to verify this solution. For 20 years, nobody come back and tell me uh, they have a uh, problem verifying the results. This answer actually is not quite correct. So when I applied PSO to uh, verify the answers, I was quite alarmed. Oh no, we are not getting these answers. But I was very uh, uh, happy to know that actually somebody pointed out this solution is not correct. And uh, you see, it takes so many years, right? Uh, 17 years for somebody to point, to, it's not what, 25 years for somebody to point out that, that answer is not wrong, uh, it's not correct. So PSO will find the right answer, which agree with the published result in a couple of seconds. Okay, okay. So you can actually make the problem more difficult. Like in, in, instead of finding what we call locally optimal design, a single best guess for the two parameters, you might be able to say, well, I think theta naught lies between one and two, and theta one lies between minus one and two, or something like this. So in that case, you have a harder problem because. Uh, there are lots of possibility for the true values of theta not theta one. So you have to come up with a criterion to reflect what you want to do. So here's one possible in terms of a minimax or maximum design, depending how you uh, frame it. So here you can say, well, this might be a good design. I am looking for the theta which give me the worst uh, efficiency of the design. So I'm trying to find a design that minimizes the worst efficiency that could arise, irrespective of which data in the two intervals is the correct uh, value. So I do not know of any algorithm that actually solve this kind of problem. So my first PhD student, uh, we worked this thing out. Uh, so suppose data naught lies between this interval and data one lies between this interval. And the only two we had at that time is the equivalence theorem. And you can see that if you run any algorithm, uh, the algorithm that we know or people use actually works for linear models. So the only two is the equivalence theorem, and this is actually found by Mathematica. So this was a long time ago, and we, we, I didn't know any of this evolutionary algorithm. And the problem is, for this such problem, what is the optimal design? The first question is, how many points do I need? So if you guess wrongly, maybe it's two points or three points, you will never get it to work. So we use mathematical to verify the equivalence theorem. So there's a condition I didn't show you, but you can check if this design satisfies an inequality, then you can know for sure you have the optimal design. So every time we make guesses, guesses, and this one probably took six months, and finally one day we thought this might be it and uh, we were jumping up and down. So the, this is one of the sensitivity function I talk about. So if you found the optimal design, it should be bounded above by zero. You can standardize it uh, by zero. And then there are so many peaks that must coincide with the location where the support points are. So if you go back here, so this is where you can see at these points, uh, we have a peak uh, in, in that plot. So once you have the plot that you're looking for, you know you have the right answer. But other than that, it's just keep on guessing and guessing. And in fact, this is the first problem I apply. Uh, I send it to the computer scientists. If you think this algorithm is so good, can you find optimal design for this, right? So they actually, they implemented the algorithm. And I was shocked that you can find it in a few seconds, literally. Okay, moving along, uh, why using uh, nature-inspired meteorologic uh, uh, algorithm? Many of those don't require you to discretize the design space. And for high-dimensional problems, uh, that's not a feasible thing to do if you just say have uh, uh, how many covariates here, right? Number of equally spaced, I have 10 covariates, 
And even you discretize uh, uh, each factor by seven equally spaced points, that's how much time it takes in a relatively decent computer to generate the grid, let alone do any function evaluations. So if you are trying to uh, solve problems like this with five or six factors, uh, I don't think that would work in, uh, by just doing discretization. So that's a common technique to do, and many of the state-of-the-art algorithms in statistics in design use them, uh, multi multiplicative algorithm or cocktail-based algorithm. So that's a so-called state-of-the-art algorithm based on Fedorov algorithm that uh, published in uh, JASA. All these need the space to be discretized. And then not only that, for Bayesian optimal designs, where you have to do integration, uh, most of the literature assumes you have independent uniform prior, which is not realistic. And what I learned is even if you change this interval slightly, or uh, not slightly, the algorithm works fine in this interval, but when you change this, even with k equals to 1, the algorithm that worked previously doesn't work, suggesting there are all these scaling, scaling issues that are not well discussed in the literature. So in other words, high dimensional problems give you problems that you may not be effect, uh, have been thinking about. So I get a chance to work with engineers who always use mathematical programming, semi-definite programming, semi-infinite programming. But again, all those techniques also require that the space be discretized. Okay? So all this suggests that uh, let's look for other kind of algorithms. I put this slide here by Rod Litter uh, from University of Michigan, Department of Biostat. So this is what he talked about in one of the Fisher lecture award a, a lecture, I think a few years ago, where he basically uh, talked about mathematics tree, meaning that in statistics, there are still this very uncomfortable relationship between mathematics and statistics. And many of the papers uh, was like, you need to do a lot of math. And basically his message was, let's hold back a bit. You, you can do very good statistics work without doing a lot of math. I mean, don't be so animoid with mathematics. There are a lot of proof and theorem, but some of them may not be very uh, applicable in practice. So one best example I'd like to cite is simulator annealing that statisticians use a lot. Uh, there's clear proof of convergence that that thing works. But in practice, and if you read all these other optimization journals, you can see that it's very uh, panned down, meaning that everybody knows that thing doesn't work in practice in real life unless you have infinite time. So are there better alternatives? And this is what I am saying, that such algorithms, very underutilized in statistics, they are very flexible and can basically use for optimizing anything, not only for design. They are assumptions-free. You don't have to assume things are differentiable or, or anything of that sort. It's very easy to program and implement. So all my work is asking graduate students who know nothing about such uh, algorithms, and then they just uh, implement this, and they become very good at it very fast. And uh, in, in the words of some UCLA engineer professors, uh, oh, all this thing is very amazing and magical. And these are professors who work for NASA, right? He used PSO to speed up communication between satellite or between cell phone. Uh, it doesn't need to discretize the search space, so I said that's good. Uh, and then you can solve high-dimensional problem. I hope I get a chance to show you. And even what is more interesting about such algorithms, like in terms of finding optimal designs, if you have a proof, the proof is always very strict laced, meaning that you can find only design with sometimes minimal number of points. So you have five parameters, your design will be five parameters, uh, five support points. With such algorithms, uh, because it's stochastic, so they can actually find you optimal design with different number of support points, which can be very helpful, because sometimes you don't want to use designs that you cannot check for model adequacy. And then, of course, sometimes you have singular design, meaning that, for instance, if you want to estimate the turning point, in a non-linear model, uh, sometimes there are five parameters, but the optimal design has only three points. So in, in which case, the Fisher information matrix is singular, and you cannot uh, work with the regular inverse. 
So the current algorithm will get stuck, right? It has to fudge around with the G inverse. But again, with PSO, it just solve it all the same uh, with no extra problem. So my take now is if you really only depend on solving the problem analytically using mathematics, that can be a bit limiting, especially for real complex problem where it is quite impossible to solve it uh, analytically. So I think using this kind of uh, algorithm can be very helpful. And I'll show you that even if you are so interested in analytic derivation with PSO, you can run and run, and after a few times, you really first of all know that how many support points is needed and where they are. So from then, you can use math and working with the sensitivity function, you can actually come up with closed form solutions for complicated problems like standardized uh, uh, maximum. So these two papers, I didn't hear anyone mention in this workshop, but it's uh, two of my favorites. Where, they, where this author really uh, spent a lot of time and systematically combed huge databases, you know, Google and whatnot you have, and basically explain or try to explain why this meta heuristic algorithm, Nature Inspire, uh, and if you read this, there are all these graph tables, histogram, and that shows you is dominating the optimizing literature even in academia, where it's traditionally obsessed with proof and integer programming, quadratic programming. So by far, this class of algorithm has dominated the optimization world. He also showed that the US government, in terms of patents awards, uh, it is a clear, a huge percentage, almost invariably go to people working with this. Because I think that's what, in the real world, people have to resolve uh, resort to such algorithms to uh, get good ideas what the solution might be. So as I say, you know, they have uh, it's, it's clear knowledge among people working in this area. This thing can work well for hundreds or thousands of variables. And in this uh, forward that I came across, they say in the next decade, we are going to see how well this works when you have millions or billions of variables to optimize. So what are these things? Well, that's what you see in Wikipedia. And if you have worked with genetic algorithms or simulated annealing, it does what it says here. You know, it's generated a, a swarm, candidate solution, and uh, it will just iterate, uh, finding the best fitness function as it goes along. Something stochastic along the way so that it won't start in the uh, local optimum. It doesn't guarantee the solution will be optimum, but then if you run this, that's what the literature say, and that's what I was very convinced of. Very quickly, you find if it's not the optimum solution, something very close to the optimum. So there are many such algorithms. I just focus on nature-inspired, and this is a particular class that I work with the most. So this is, if you saw this picture, I think, yesterday. So look at this, and you, can we learn something from how the birds fly or how the fish uh, do what it does to defend a whale going to attack them? And uh, it always amazes me, the, the, there's always no compelling uh, theory behind this, at least up to now. And typically, all these algorithms are defined by one or two very simple equations. That's why it's very easy to implement. So in this case, what we have here is the velocity for which the i particular flies to the current position xi. And then by that time, he has uh, some perception where the best uh, optimum is. And he or she communicates with the rest of the flock and come uh, to a conclusion that's the global optimum. So imagine they're looking for food on the ground. The, each bird has their own perception where the food is and then communicate with the rest of the flock. Each of them has their own perception of where the food is, and then they discuss and come up with this global optimum. So it flies basically with a certain velocity in the direction of the global optimum, and they are not willing to give up where they think the local optimum is. And then with these two simple equations and some stochastic elements, so beta 1, beta 2 are stochastic elements to make it random, and then there are some flock characteristics, C1, C2, suggest how communicative the birds are, how smart the birds are, and stuff like that. And then there's an inertial element telling how, uh, how uh, they, they are lazy or how they modulate things like that. 
So with all these algorithms, uh, they always have tuning parameters, and one big problem may be that you don't know what these values to input. So I think one reason why PSO seems to be popular is that these two default values seem to really work well. So uh, constantly reported by other researchers, and uh, I find it to work amazingly well, except for one case. So, so very easy to implement, and once you implement this, let it run, and you will converge to what you are looking for. So not to say PSO is the only one, there are zillions of them. So here's just one uh, sample of other nature-inspired metaheuristic algorithm. Those in red is what I understand from the literature are very competitive with PSO, uh, and I have some experience, no, not, not too much with this, uh, but with this. Uh, so th there are a lot of research you need to do, and some of these are more targeted to certain type of problems. So cuckoo bird is something that uh, is interesting. The story doesn't make sense at all, but it actually works amazingly well. So what's the story? How, what do you know about a cuckoo's bird? Well, it can sing very well. The sound is nice, but it turns out in nature, as I learned it, I don't know anything about it, but, but it's a very lazy mother, right? It lays the egg and it never wants to look after the eggs. So what the mother uh, cuckoo does, take the egg, goes around, and there's another type of bird that just looks like a cuckoo. So you look at the nest of this other bird and then put the eggs inside the, the nest and hope that the host uh, bird will take care of its own eggs, right? Uh, so, and then the way this thing works, the birds have to move with, according to a Levy's distribution. So maybe you can tell us what this Levy distribution has to do with this. And then there's a probability of being discovered that this egg is not mine, and then the host bird will kick out the, the, the cuckoo's egg. That's the story. So somehow you implement the equation, it really works beautiful. So it's a lot of intrigue and mystery. But, uh, so this is a guy that actually, uh, as somebody already noted, he's quite an authority in this area in engineering using these algorithms. So this is something he wrote in 2008, and then he felt compelled to publish less than two years later on another update because this field is so dynamic, explosive, and so exciting. So you can get this book at Amazon.com for about $16, $18. So uh, some of my work based on uh, evolutionary algorithm is, is what you see here, a different type of problem. I'll just run through briefly what this thing does and a little bit more in detail later on. So this is the work where my PhD student uh, published in Sukenten's journal, right? Wow. So I was very proud because it's a non-statistical journal and then it seems to work. So they all tackle very different problems. Uh, so this is just actually illustrating different kind of problems that this algorithm can solve very well. So uh, they are uh, like compartmental models, logistic models, uh, and survival models. So all these things work very easily. And then this one is uh, solving minimum X problem, the one I described uh, before. So again, this thing can solve more complicated problems than I discussed uh, earlier on uh, using just PSO. And this one's for mixture models. Uh, now this, the, those are in red are a bit different. Those are exact optimal design. So you see like it's not restricted to one type of design. So this is uh, based on Chen Ching Sui. You know, he works in all this super saturated design. And by and large, they work as best as they can, but only up to small number of factors. You know, so small n and small p. And there's a, a lower bound that you can verify whether your answer is correct up to a certain level. So the way we handle all this thing is we always want to use PSO to verify what is published in the literature for small dimensional problem and make sure it gives you the same answer as what they found in theory. And after that, we generalize it to uh, much higher dimension. So this one is for minimizing the correlation between the rows, uh, between the columns in the supersaturated design. So this is actually one for a longitudinal study. Um, so now you have a longitudinal study and then patients come in. You want to know how many times you need to sample urine or blood from the patient, uh, what time, and uh, how many time points. 
so th this is something I will just talk about in, in just a bit uh, to illustrate in a little bit more detail what this does. Okay, so I talk about the minimax problem and now uh, people know that that minimax criterion I show you may not be the best, the right thing to do, you have to do a standardized maximum D optimal design or minimax, they are the same thing. So what am I trying to do here? That's the criterion I'm trying to optimize. I essentially try to find a probability measure, right? That's an approximate design. So uh, I'm giving the, the design space X, right? X in this context was uh, uh, enzyme kinetic models. Uh, there are two factors. And what I'm trying to do is, uh, these are nonlinear models. So I have to find the locally optimal design first, right? And after that, uh, I want to find uh, the worst data that will give me the worst efficiency. And then trying to find a design that maximizes the minimum efficiency. So what do I do? I just guess if it's five parameter, maybe design, this design is five points. And uh, there are five axes there. And then I would do this optimization. So uh, CAM is very complicated, and there's no closed form solutions for such design unless the nonlinear parameter is one or two models. So this is in a context of an example taken from the Journal of Biopharmaceutical Studies. So enzyme kinetics, how much enzyme we need to put in this reaction and how much substrate, right? So it's a two-factor experiment, and they're different inhibition models. And, uh, so what we did was uh, we were able to actually find the maximum designs, uh, standardized maximum designs, and also corrected some of the assumptions made in the literature. And for this particular problem, we were also able to find this formula for a very, very complicated, uh, a very complicated formula for one of these designs for three nonlinear parameters. Uh, parameters. So the formula actually goes for two pages, but just to demonstrate, if you really want formulas, this thing can help you do it. This is actually a very interesting example, a fun problem that we uh, make up to test how well PSO works. So uh, Simon design is a very old and still very widely used design in clinical trials. So basically, uh, you have a drug comes into uh, uh, existence and I'm an entrepreneur and I want to invest in this drug. I want to do it in two stages. I try with 10 patients. If none of them responds or two responds, I say quit. I don't want to waste any more time. But then if the drug is promising, say, oh, it's actually 50% effective. I'm willing to uh, invest more money and recruit more patients and hopefully I see a lot more responders. And then I make a decision whether to go forward for a larger study. So in this case, I have to decide how many numbers of patients in stage one, how many responders before I'm happy or not happy. And then if I'm happy to move on to stage two, how many more patients I need and how many more responders I should expect to see. So you are talking about hypothesis testing, so this uh, type one, type two error plays in. So uh, when he proposed Simon, I didn't say Simon, but Richard Simon from NIH, uh, it's a greedy search. So this is binomial probabilities, conditional probabilities. And uh, you just crank out the math, which is not difficult. And then uh, uh, do a greedy search, and it came out with the optimal design. So many, many years later, uh, Ling and Shi basically commented on this formulation. It's easy to say, you know, if I have 2 out of 10, then forget it. Right? But where is this P1 coming from? P1, the larger the P1, the more promising the drug. So you might be actually uh, uh, shorting yourself. If, in fact, the drug is 80% and now you test it at 40%, then you might also have to repeat that trial. So P1 is not clear uh, how to uh, arrive at this P1. P0, P1 are assumed to be known. So basically, Lin and she say, well, maybe depending what we see here, then we decide whether to test this alternative hypothesis or another alternative hypothesis where the P11, uh, one, one, whatever, uh, is larger than that. Okay? So, and then in this biometrics paper in 2004, basically they say they took uh, days and weeks to arrive at the computation results and have exhausted the uh, limits of the computer at that time. So this is what Simon Design does uh, in uh, 
uh, uh, phase one, and the question is, uh, given type one, type two error, uh, how many I need in stage one, responders, and then N2, and all this, right? So we decide to use PSO to test what happened if I have three sets of alternative hypotheses, and that will involve uh, uh, three sets of type one, type two errors, including a lot more parameters, uh, what I need to do. So this is, as I said, a kind of a, a testing uh, how good PSO is. But when you do that, uh, it will show that actually there are 10 integer, positive integer that you need to optimize. And it's a constraint optimization problem because clearly you cannot have more responders in the second stage than number recruited in the second stage. So these are all integer value uh, problem. And the, the extension is quite straightforward if you are familiar with the calculation conditional probabilities. And uh, it turns out the straight PSO actually doesn't work, but if uh, my co-author quite good at this, but if you modified it and fine-tune it enough, it was able to uh, deliver the results. I'm not going to show you tables, uh, but it's, now here's another problem that illustrates when theory fails, PSO always helps. So uh, somebody uh, constructed optimal design for, in this case, I think it's a, a Poisson or, or logistic models. Anyway, it's a GLM. And the results was that when you have some continuous factors and some discrete factors, uh, the, the algorithm, there was theory to find out what's the optimal design. Uh, one assumption they make was one of these continuous factors has to be unbounded. So it, can, it must take on any values. So this is the solution. Uh, and then we apply PSO and make this unbounded enough to reflect the theory of the uh, problem that the tackle. And that's, you see the uh, optimal design here is equally weighted at four points. So you can argue whether this is better than that. But my point is, if this is actually bounded, so if the last factor is also bounded, say, between minus two and two, so this is not implementable because this is outside the design space. So what is the optimal design? So if you apply PSO, as I say, this is up to you to input, right? So PSO comes back with uh, this result, right? So if you are uh, having this interval for the last continuous factor, so you have a bit more design points, and then this is the optimal solution that you can verify using sensitivity function is the right answer. So it's a very flexible tool and can answer questions that theory, when theory fails. Okay, so let's skip this. Uh, now I, I'm going to give you a demonstration, so I want to just set up the uh, background for this. Uh, many experiments have multiple objectives, and uh, some are more important than others, and what you want to do is to find design that can give you more efficiencies for the more important criterion. Uh, so when you have two objectives, uh, it's relatively easy to do. That was uh, the uh, main uh, message here. And then somebody, uh, Clyde and Charlene, extended it to nonlinear models and multiple objectives. So the theory is actually worked out, but in practice, it's still very difficult to do. So let me show you. Uh, this, no, at that time, no. At, that, at this time, it's not PSO. Uh, we were using, working with toy examples. So this is published in JASA. We have a simple versus quadratic and all those things. Then, so some, uh, PSO to find this thing. Set, uh, yeah, do objective. So, so uh, some standard, uh, actually, well, you'll see in the next few slides, it's actually quite easy to do when you have only two objectives. So that you can formulate still under convex criteria. And it's easy to say the more important one, I make sure it's small enough. And subject to that requirement, I want to make the second criterion as small as possible. So that is actually very, very intuitive. But then a simple problem might be just, oh, let's convex, com combine these two criterion. A convex combination of two convex functional is still convex. So essentially, I have one uh, objective. So for each lambda, I would just find the optimal design that would optimize this. So that's very doable. So for each, so this is what we call compound optimal design. For each lambda, find a design that optimizes this. 
And then the, 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 it turns out there's a direct relationship between the two, though not very obvious. So that's the problem you want to solve. But what happens is you solve this easier problem and find out what's the relationship between lambda and C. So for two objective, it's very easy to do. You just do an efficiency plot. You plot the efficiency of the compound optimal design across all this lambda. And from there, you deduce what is the C that, uh, that you have. Then you look at the lambda that will give you that solution. Okay? Uh, so two objectives, relatively easy. And when you do the efficiency plot, it always looks like this. One's going up, the other coming down, suggesting you have to give up of one criterion to get a gain in the other. Right. So uh, if you have always like this, so if they are very steep, that suggests the two criteria is very comp uh, competitive. So over here, after this graph is done, you look at E1. Well, E1, if you want to have 80%, you just draw a horizontal line and see where the lambda is. And that lambda will give you the corresponding constraint optimal design you uh, were looking for. Uh, so. Uh, we play around with this for quite a while, but this is uh, one of the latest work when we try now to actually solve a, a real uh, three objective optimal design problem. So this is an example taken from a medical journal. So this is an inhibitory drug using a four parameter logistic models or the Hale model. And the more uh, higher concentration of the drug, the tumor would shrink and you don't do anything, it will just stay there. So some of the quantities of this drug that you want to study is understand uh, what are the parameters in this model. Uh, so that's a, a four parameter model. Uh, what is the dose I should give to have the drug, the, the tumor string by 50% or maybe only 20%. So those are ED50. I want to find a dose that would result in 50% strainage of the tumor or maybe 25, okay? So there are three objectives that I'm interested to uh, ascertain. And if you do the math up to some point, uh, you want to maximize this function in terms of the efficiencies. So this is actually a concave functional that you can actually uh, try to optimize, but uh, if you use uh, PSO, it gives you a very quick answer, as I will show you. But of course, this is a collaborator who doesn't do PSO. He's working with the uh, 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 plain O objective, and those algorithm takes a lot more to generate the optimal design than using PSO. So I'm going to demonstrate very quickly two uh, examples. So if the first one is to find the optimal design for estimating all those parameters. And then the other one is the three objective optimal design. Uh, so again, this is uh, a code developed by my first student who doesn't know uh, even MATLAB. So he said, I learned a little bit about MATLAB in my sophomore in China. So these are the parameters you input that you saw over there. And uh, so you can play around with this any time, and then uh, number of iteration, number of particles. So you can just pick anything you want. If 500 you think is too much, maybe try 300. And so this is the dose range. If you want 53, just change it to 53. And if you say run, um, let's see what happens. This is using PSO. And you actually found, well, that's very assuring because when you see 0.25, so people who know optimal design theory, you have four points, four parameters, that looks like it's optimal. And when you run the flock, so each point you see is a candidate design, 100 of them at the beginning. And then very quickly, in less than 300 iterations, actually 200 something stops, right? You find the optimum solution there, and these are the four design points, but you cannot see four, just three-dimensional, and this is what it is. So you can play around with this, and very uh, quickly, you can also verify, oh, you get the plot that you want, right? So you mean this is a strict PSO algorithm? This is a strict PSO algorithm. So this one, yeah, in 3.5 seconds, but I'll show you uh, another one uh, that is written uh, 
put together by a student from Futan, right? He's actually visiting me for 10 weeks in LA from Futan, and he is so impressive. He doesn't know anything about optimal design or any of this thing, but when he left, this is what he left. And I felt so bad because after three, four years, I haven't found time to write up the paper. So currently, he's in biostatistics, doing his PhD in John Hopkins University. So this is what he uh, left me with. Oops, sorry. Uh, so you see, he actually implemented not only one, but several of these algorithms, the drop-down menu, D, E, G, E, and these are algorithms from JASA, where you have to discretize the uh, design space. So for that particular problem, there are actually six different uh, experts with different opinion what the uh, nominal values of the parameters are. So you can just pick one of those. And this is what I like. You can just put any interval you want, provided uh, you get the shape that you think uh, is reflective of what you want to do. So this is the optimal design, and the first thing I would do is, well, you can say, is this something reflective of what the plot you actually saw? If you're happy with it, then you can say, I can run. Well, you have to choose the algorithm first, so let's choose uh, PSO first. And in this case, let's say you use eight flocks, right? Which is a bit small, but actually it works quite well. So I run this, uh, and then come back with me with that answer. Uh, let's see that. So this is in 1.42 seconds, right? And then you can verify, is it correct answer? Well, it looks pretty close, right? So all these uh, design points is where these picks are, okay? So if you uh, try something else, I bet you, I don't think this thing works. That's why I'm a bit biased. Uh, uh, I, I play this enough, I know which one outperform each other. So with GA, you see it comes with something like this. Uh, and then you see that is that optimal? Uh, so in this case, it's not too bad, but most of the time you can see it actually give you a uh, much worse answer than this. So i show you a compound optimal design. So these are the lambda weights, uh, let's say minus two and minus five. Uh, so now I, now I want a compound optimal design and I can use genetic, or let's say uh, cuckoos, right? Let's use cuckoos algorithm and I run this, uh, so that is the answer. Is that correct? So you can see this weight is very small, right? So probably it may not be optimal yet, but if I look at it, I can be quite happy, and actually there are so many versions of this program. Another version actually tells me the efficiency of this design. So I can decide, oh, if this is 99.8% efficient, I may call it quit, okay? So the first time, I actually chicken out at the Cambridge, uh, uh, the Newton Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Uh, I was about to demonstrate, but I was afraid because what happened, this thing doesn't work, right? So the first time I, have, I, I, I chicken out, but after having done this enough, uh, this thing actually works. So that's why it doesn't matter what the flock size. These are default parameters, and if it doesn't work, it just take one, two, three seconds, right, before you know whether you are happy with the answer. So if you work uh, with uh, the JASA algorithm and you discretize like this, it will take forever. And it actually would not work as well. So, okay, with that, I need to move on. Uh, so with Bayesian, you can do the same thing. So when you see a plot like this, ah, that's the, in this case, we put independent uniform prior on all the parameters and that worked. So some of the current work I'm doing is, uh, as I mentioned, but this is with real studies with people at Harvard on pediatric HIV. They were trying to design studies to uh, better understand the characteristic of the drugs. Uh, convergent issues, uh, I'm not, but I'm happy I, I found some support here. People seem to be interested to look into these problems. So uh, that's what we are doing too. And then high dimensional problem. I have yet to show you a high dimensional problem, but this is one of the latest work my student did. Poisson models, and you have five factors and all pairwise uh, interaction included. So if you calculate, uh, there are 16 parameters, so you know you need at least 16 points. With 16 points, five factors, you need to multiply by five, so 80 
uh, variables to optimize at least. And then you have the weight, so there are 16 points. And so, yes, it's 95 variable problems, variables to optimize. And you actually never know whether that works because who tells you it's minimally supported, right? So maybe it needs uh, 25 points, in which case the number of variables they need to optimize would goes up very quickly. But uh, here's one optimal design, design he found. But actually, after all the work, I'm actually a bit disappointed. It's very challenging to find this thing. But then, uh, as with another work, you can see all the weights are very small, suggesting that these things are not actually implementable if the sample size is small. So uh, if you have only, let's say, 100 observations for this study, uh, you might take up you know, only one observation here or sometimes half the observation somewhere else. So the weights are small, but that you can show is actually the optimal design. And how do you do that? So uh, this is another student did this. Uh, MATLAB is very incredible. So how do you actually verify a, a sensi sensitivity function with five variables actually have the shape you want. So you can do something like this for a smaller dimension in MATLAB. It looks good, but actually it's a nice picture, but you won't place too much trust in it, right? Uh, especially when this thing is very large, uh, it can be very misleading. But the tr very interesting uh, way that uh, MATLAB can help is as follows. So with five dimension, uh, uh, five axes, and you cannot draw the sensitivity function because it's a six dimensional plot, right? We can not appreciate it visually. So we discretize the design space, so e equ uh, equally space. So basically you end up with a, a design space with let's say uh, 5,000 points or even more than that. And then you just arbitrarily number them from one up to 5,000. And then you plot the fitness function or the criterion value versus these 5,000 grid points, which doesn't have any meaning because there's no ordering, right? You, you cannot say this grid point is smaller than the other. So you plot this and you look at this plot, is that optimal? Well, it doesn't look like it's optimal. You have maybe 16 points, but in MATLAB, what happened is you see something like this, and then if you start to zoom in, right, you can make this, zoom this, and as you zoom in one of these swimming peaks, you find that many of these drop, and eventually when you count the number of pits that meets zero is exactly 16. And then you also have to check that that 16 pits coincide with the support points reported in the optimal design. So that I thought is, uh, I don't know how, how else to do this, but I thought that was interesting. Uh, some closing thoughts, uh, no free lunch theorem, right? So we don't expect PSO to work for all kinds of problems. The idea is to find that this seems to work very well for finding this class of optimal design problems. And just to remind you, it has nothing to do with convexity. We chose convexity, uh, such problem to work with because we can verify right away whether PSO is giving us the right answer. So I thought that was important. And then uh, it's a general optimization tool. So now you can, and that's what we are doing too, like find minimum bias design or minimum mean square designs where there's no equivalence theorem. You get something where right? there's no theory to check and tell you whether you have the right designs. Uh, you can also, one of my students, uh, try to find MLE, right? So MLE, every program can do it, you know, Stata, MATLAB and all this. So what's so good about using PSO? I say you, you probably cannot publish this, right? So he came back and told me that eventually he discovered that if you run PSO, one advantage he has over other uh, programs in statistics is you run and sometimes in STATA or SAS, oh, you know, hazard matrix, not positive definite, right? And then stop. And then what do you do, right? It's not clear what you would do. Uh, maybe you need more data. But when you run PSO, actually, I didn't show you the background when it's splitting out the results. You can really see a divergence. Like, oh, it's actually these two parameters estimate are all over the place, suggesting that these two parameters are unidentifiable. So at least it tells you maybe you need to re-parameterize your model a bit. Uh, and right now we are doing some hybridization with actually exact methods like interior point and genetic. Do they work better and whatnot? Okay, so I think my time is a bit up, but this is also interesting too for PSO. 
uh, at first I didn't see how it relates to solving equations. So solving a system of complex nonlinear equations can be computationally problematic. So if you have PSO, all you have to do is to you know, rewrite it as try to minimize a function like this. And when you minimize that, you actually find a solution to the set of nonlinear equations you're looking for. So there are different ways of doing it, but it all suggests that to me, PSO and other such algorithms are very flexible and very helpful. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip this and just jump to the last slide. Uh, there are, of course, also algorithms based on human behavior. So this is a student who wrote to me from Germany, and he wanted me to help him. And what he used was this ICA, which is based on human history, right? Uh, how, for instance, China. So empire conquer another, and then da -da. so colonization, and you have the uh, the imperialists and the the victims. So story doesn't make sense, but again, this thing works wonderful. So I suggest for faculty try to incorporate uh, engineering and computer science classes into your curriculum. I think they are all very helpful. I'm glad that I have. Uh, I was able to convince my department just last year to, so we require a third field to finish PhD in biostat. So typically people do biostat and then a second field is uh, epidemiology or whatnot. And in addition, they need to take graduate classes in a third field like epidemiology or education psychology, something that you can apply biostat to. And then I make my student take all these uh, optimization classes from engineering and they, that don't count. So I don't think that was fair, and nowadays I think it's very important. So they, I'm able to convince them that's what I'm happy with. So very good. Okay, thank you, and I hope I actually interest some people to work on some of these problems.